So you come into Berlin and you want to experience the Berlin Wall. Now you've got a lot of options. The wall is scattered throughout Berlin in many different places. But most people who come to Berlin, they're going to go and see the Berlin Wall at the East Side Gallery. But I'm here to tell you that you should come to the Berlin Wall Memorial. And that's where I am today. I'm going to take you on a short tour. Berlin Wall Memorial is located about a mile, roughly a kilometer and a half north of the city center. It's on the border of the Mitte and Wedding districts. And this is the place that you want to come if you really want to understand exactly what the Berlin Wall is all about. So let's get started. The memorial is located just 10 minutes away by S-Bahn from Friedrichstrasse station. From Alexanderplatz, it's roughly a 15 minute ride with the U-Bahn. The memorial itself stretches 1.5 kilometers from North Bahnhof station to Mauer Park in the district of Prenzlauerberg. There is no cost to visit the memorial or documentation center, and you can visit the grounds any day of the week. I recommend that you take advantage of a very handy mobile tour guide, which is available to you. It will provide you with more information in addition to the information stations along the memorial's route. The guide has different options depending on how much time you have to spend at the memorial. I recommend that you begin your visit from North Bahnhof Station for two reasons. First, the visitor center is located here, which is open daily, except Mondays from 10 a.m. until 6 p.m. in the evening. There is a help desk, a small bookshop, an introductory film, as well as interactive guides showing you where the wall was and where parts of it remain. Most importantly for some, there are free public bathrooms. The second reason is that the station itself contains a complimentary exhibit called the Border and Ghost Stations. North Bahnhof Station was one of 16 stations on two U-Bahn and S-Bahn lines that were located either on the border between East and West Berlin or completely inside of East Berlin. The lines all started in West Berlin, passed through the East, and then returned to the West. The name Ghost Station was coined by West Berliners due to the sinister atmosphere in these dimly lit and heavily patrolled stations. Inside is an exhibit explaining how the East German government sealed off these tunnels to stop escape attempts from citizens, rail workers, and even the guards themselves. It also covers how citizens from both East and West Berlin experienced these ghost stations. And all along Bernauerstrasse and the surrounding area are these commemorative columns for the seven people who died due to the wall in this area. But first, a brief explanation of why the wall existed and how the memorial came to be here. At the conclusion of World War II, the victorious powers carved up Germany into four sections. One for the British, the French, the Americans, and the Soviet Union. And although Berlin fell deep inside the land controlled by the Soviets, what was known as East Germany, the capital itself was also split into four parts. It wouldn't be long before the areas controlled by the French, Brits, and Americans began to develop economically faster than the Soviet-controlled area. By 1961, 2.8 million East Germans had relocated to the West, roughly 20% of its population. By August of 1961, it was roughly 1,700 people per day. Most were leaving through Berlin because the border between East and West Berlin was technically still open. That all ended on August 13th, 1961, as the border here was also sealed. In this video, when I say the Berlin Wall, what I will be referring to in actuality is the barrier system that evolved over time. The barrier almost always consisted of an inner wall facing East Berlin and an outer wall facing West Berlin. Over time, guard towers, electrified signal fences, anti-vehicle barriers, and other elements were added to the barrier as reinforcements. And it's the rather late update of the outer wall design that has become the symbol and image of the Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall was a total of 140 kilometers, 87 miles long, but only 47 kilometers actually separated east from West Berlin. The rest separated West Berlin from the East German state of Brandenburg. But here on Bernauerstrasse, a unique situation where the entire street, including both sidewalks, belonged to West Berlin, but the buildings on one side belonged to the east. Bernauerstrasse was witness to some of the most dramatic early attempts of escape and became a symbolic area for resistance to the wall and the regime behind it. And shortly after the wall fell in 1989, locals here organized to save at least a small section from wall peckers and land developers. And thus the Berlin Wall Memorial was born. The memorial is made up of four sections, A, B, C, and D. Each section covers different aspects of the barrier, but the content blends in from one section to the other. Within each section are several stations where you will find information boards and audio and video accounts of eyewitnesses and images displaying how the wall looked, developed, and interacted with the landscape. And if you are short on time, then I recommend focusing your attention on sections A and B. So let's get started. 
Now, throughout most of the memorial, you are walking along what was referred to as the death strip, the area between the inner and outer walls. And you will also notice that pieces of the outer wall that no longer exist have been replaced by these reddish brown poles that add, in my mind, some symbolic transparency to the memorial. This area of the memorial covers the evolution of the border wall's construction, its reinforcement, as well as how the East German government enforced security in the area just behind the border. There are four stations. The first one is titled The Wall and the Border Strip. Its purpose is to give you an immediate appreciation of the border fortifications. Each station has some images that show the area where you are and how it once appeared. And right next door is station number two called Bergstrasse. Bergstrasse was one of roughly 300 streets that were cut off due to the wall. Today, it is the only street that is still cut off. This section displays some remains of both the street as well as the components of the barriers set up here. In this image, from left to right, you can see the excavated remains of the sidewalk of Bergstrasse. Beside it, you can see two pieces of the bottom of the Sophian Parish Cemetery wall. And in this image, you can see to the right, Bernauer Strasse. Bergstrasse is laid out left to right, with the church cemetery walls butting up against both. These remains we are seeing are part of the foundation of this part of the cemetery wall. And here we have the wires covered with cement that powered the lamps that ran along the length of the wall. And lastly, we have the foundation of a post for the signals fence. This was a fence that set off an alarm to the guards in the towers when someone attempted to climb it. We are now walking up to the third station in Area A, which is called the Wall of Remembrance. While the exact number of people who died at the Berlin Wall from 1961 to 1989 is unknown, the Berlin Wall Memorial commemorates 138. 98 were fugitives. Many were shot, while some of which were fatally injured while trying to escape, such as falling from the top of a border building. More on that to come. Eight were East German citizens who were mistaken for fugitives and were shot. And another eight were East German border guards who died on duty, some attempting to escape themselves. 22 were West Germans. 42 were children and teenagers. Several of them were young children from West Berlin, including eight-year-old Cengava Katranzi. He fell into the river Spree and drowned. The particular tragedy of his death was that he could have been rescued, but no one jumped into the river to save him for fear of being shot by the East Berlin guards. You can see that each nook holds an image of the victim, has their name, and their dates of birth and death. There are also empty spots that are available for additional individuals in case information compiled in the future confirms that they died as a result of the wall. Just steps away from the wall of remembrance are several long pieces of steel on the ground, commemorating the graves of civilian war victims that had been relocated deeper into the cemetery by the East Berlin authorities. The cemetery is still there today, German cemeteries are really pleasantly landscaped, as you can see here. In this image, I am standing at the orange dot with the current cemetery to my back and the steel rods in front of me. And in the bottom image, you can see a view of the cemetery in 1962 from a building on the West Berlin side of Bernauerstrasse. The image just above it shows East German border guards patrolling the cemetery in 1966, just before the aforementioned graves were displaced. Also a part of the station are 32 pieces of the Berlin Wall that were removed by the Sophia Parish Church to be saved from demolition as a reminder that graves once stood here. They came from an 18 meter long section of the wall adjacent to the station, which has been replaced by the reddish steel rods that I mentioned previously in this video. And slightly down the death strip from the station is a stone monument in the shape of a tombstone. It's a memorial to the victims of the Second World War and acknowledges that many of the remains of these victims are likely still buried underneath this section of the memorial. Now, we are headed to the original section of the memorial called the Monument, which is located right behind the wall directly ahead. But a quick stop here to show you another component of the memorial that was initiated by the Sophia Parish, this reconstruction of the cemetery's main entrance gate. And now we are headed to the building across the street, which is the memorial's documentation center, and head to the top of its lookout tower, where we will get a bird's eye view of the monument and areas A and B. The monument, what is officially called the Monument to the Victims of Communist Tyranny and to the Memory of the German Division, was dedicated in 1998 and was the first part of today's Berlin Wall Memorial to ever exist. 
It is a 70 meter long section of the Berlin Wall fortification system and is preserved mostly as it looked as the Berlin Wall fell. At the far end you have the inner wall, the wall located the deepest inside of East German territory. Next you can see a line of short posts that once held up the signal fencing, which no longer is there. Also gone are the steel mats with spikes, what West Berliners refer to as Stalin's lawn, that awaited any fugitive who made it over the signal fence. Next, we can see two lamps that illuminated the guard road as well as the preserved guard tower. Also missing from the monument are the anti-tank spikes and the anti-vehicle ditches that would have been situated between the guard road and the outer wall. This outer wall was part of the 1975 upgrade to the security barrier. It's what many people think of when they first think of the Berlin Wall. The views from here afford you some nice views of central Berlin with the TV tower and the Berlin Cathedral straight ahead in the distance. Just underneath the tower is the Memorial's Documentation Center, where you can see an exhibition titled 1961-1989, The Berlin Wall. Through the use of numerous objects, witness testimonials, biographies, and audiovisual media, it attempts to answer the following three questions. Why was the wall built? How did East and West Berliners experience it? And why did it fall? There is also a small bistro serving coffee, pastries, and light meals, including soups and bratwursts. We are now heading into Area B, which moves the focus of the memorial to the people who lived here on Bernauerstrasse. Directly ahead of us, we are looking at the side of a building with images painted on it showing different time periods for this intersection of Bernauerstrasse and Ackerstrasse. The image at the top shows Ackerstrasse being sealed off in 1961 with cement blocks as two boys and a man look on. Then we have an image in 1963 showing an additional layer, likely of wood, serving as the outer wall. And lastly, an image showing how this corner looked in 1990, just after the border was open. You can see this building in the image as well as the guard tower in the monument next door. To see just how much has changed, here is an image of this intersection from the early 20th century. You can see the Sophia Parish Cemetery wall here, which extended to Akestrasse. And behind the streetcar are the tenement buildings that would quickly be vacated and boarded up, as you can see in this image. And not too long after that, these buildings would be demolished, with the bottom halves of their Bernauerstrasse facades serving as a makeshift outer wall. And throughout the memorial, in the ground, you can see steel outlines of these very buildings to remind visitors of their destruction. Okay, now we move on to Station 2, which is called the Chapel of Reconciliation. If you were to walk along Bernauerstrasse in the 1950s, you would have come across a beautiful Gothic church called the Reconciliation Church, which would unfortunately find itself in the middle of no man's land. The majority of the church's congregation resided in the West Berlin district of Wedding, and its parishioners would soon find themselves cut off from their church. The church's steeple was used as an early lookout tower, but both the church and the steeple would be destroyed in 1985 as part of the last border upgrade. Here is the mangled iron cross from the top of the church's steeple. It was found and hidden by a member of the church who lived behind the church in the eastern side. And adjacent to it is the Chapel of Reconciliation, which is built on the foundation of the old church and partly from the rubble from it. At noon, from Tuesdays through Fridays, the chapel hosts a prayer service in honor of a victim of the Berlin Wall. It changes each day. Inside, you can find a replica of the Coventry Cross of Nails, a symbol of hope and friendship in the aftermath of conflict. The original was formed by three medieval nails found in the wreckage of Coventry Cathedral following a German bombing raid in World War II. Outside of the chapel, you will find the Statue of Reconciliation, also a gift to the memorial from Coventry Cathedral. And in 2011, the memorial uncovered a part of the church's foundation that had been laid buried beneath the surface of the death strip. It was the northeast corner of the church's central nave that these foundation stones held up. And as with the buildings in the area that fell victim to the Berlin Wall, the outline of the church's foundations are laid out in steel on the ground. And lastly, the bells of the church's tower were preserved prior to the building's destruction and are now on display just outside of the chapel. Just a short walk from the chapel is station number three of area B, which is titled Suffering of the People. What you see here are the excavated remains of building 10A on Bernauerstrasse. 10A had been a mixed use building with a shop on the ground floor and residencies above it. Due to a quirk in Berlin's layout, the entirety of Bernauerstrasse, including the sidewalks, belonged to West Berlin. Therefore, the residents along this side of the street had easy access to the west. 
As the border was being sealed, many took the opportunity to escape, aided by the West Berlin Fire Department and West Berlin citizens. Some slid down drain pipes or ropes, while others jumped out of their windows to freedom. Not everyone was successful. It was at this moment that the Berlin Wall claimed its first victim. Ida Siegmann was the first of four people to die in these very early days. At age 59, she attempted to jump from her third floor apartment. She jumped before the fireman could completely unfurl the jumping net. She unfortunately died from her injuries. The wall separated families and friends, even in the early days, when direct communication between them was still possible here on Bernauer Strasse. In this image, a bride and groom in the West are visiting their parents on their wedding day, a testament to the inhumanity of the barrier. By September of 1961, the buildings along Bernauerstrasse were completely sealed. The remaining residents were forced to relocate, and the buildings were erased almost completely. Now moving on, the final station in Area B is called Escaping to the West, which chronicles some of the daring escape attempts that took place here on Bernauerstrasse. There were many ways that people attempted to escape from East Berlin, but the tunnels are what most people associate with the wall. There were around 75 tunnels that were dug underneath the Berlin Wall, and roughly 300 people successfully crawled through them. The majority of the tunnels were unsuccessful. Here on Bernauerstrasse, there were 10 tunnels built from the west to the east, and their routes are marked by these metal plates. Only three of the 10 here were successful ferrying fugitives to the west. Tunnel 57 was one of them, and it facilitated the escape of 57 people, hence the name, the most of any tunnel system. And here is a surveillance tunnel dug by the Stasi. It ran diagonally across the Berlin Wall in an attempt to intercept and perhaps discourage escape tunnels. And in the past few years, the nonprofit Berlin Underworld, Berlin Unterwelten, which runs tours of the city's underground, including former bunkers, started a new tour that visits one of the Bernauer Strasse tunnels. It's called Tor M, but as of 2022, the tour is only available in German, though there's a good chance that the guide speaks English. And now, as we exit Area B and cross Strelzerstrasse, here is a steel tower marking the location of the next guard tower in the district. And roughly 50 meters down the street is a building 57, which is where the entrance to Tunnel 7 was located. The tunnel entrance was located in the back courtyard. It was ultimately betrayed by an informant, and in an attempt to stop a flight of refugees, an East German border guard was shot and killed by another border guard in an accident. Okay, now we are entering Area C, titled Building the Wall, which covers the evolution of the border wall's construction, its reinforcement, as well as how the East German government enforced security in the area just behind the border. The first station, Rebuilding the Border Fortification, covers the evolution of the wall and how its builders analyze escape attempts to make improvements to the border system, starting from a simple concrete wall with barbed wire to the more elaborate and impenetrable system that you have now probably come to understand better. It's here more than anywhere that you can get a good sense of this evolution through photos, audio, and text. The second station here is surveillance of the border area. Here you will learn how the GDR government spied on its citizens who lived just beyond the wall and how local residents were recruited to aid the government, mostly as informants, all in order to reduce the chances of successful escapes. The last subject station here is called the wall at Brunnenstrasse, where you will find a large mural of one of the most iconic images of the wall, the escape of Konrad Schumann, an East German border guard, who just a few days after the start of the wall's construction made a daring leap over the border to freedom. His jump was actually one street further on. Area D, the final section, is titled Everyday Life of the Wall. Unlike the other sections, this section is very spread out, with station blocks apart from each other. The section focuses on the daily lives of both the residents on the west side of the Bernauerstrasse, as well as the tunnel diggers and escape helpers, and even the border guards themselves. The very last station is titled The Wall in Politics, and explains how West Berlin and West Germany portray the city and East Berlin in domestic and local politics and foreign diplomacy. And that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this short walk through this important memorial. Links to the memorial's website, as well as their audio tour, will be in the video description. We'll also link to our tour page with a tour guide's view of the memorial. Links to our Facebook group, Experience Berlin Travel Tips, will also be in the description, as well as links to our free walking tours here in Berlin. Please leave questions or comments in the comment section below, and be sure to check out our other videos on this channel. Until next time, goodbye from Berlin.